in 2019, a remarkable thing happened. There was a peak in public acceptance of human evolution in the US as measured by the Gallup poll asking this question, which of the following statements comes closest to your views on the origin and development of human beings? One, human beings have developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life, but God had no part in this process. Two, human beings have developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life, but God guided this process. Three, God created human beings pretty much in their present form at one time within the last 10,000 years or so. If you just take the people who think God played no part in the origin of human beings, that exciting peak number in 2019 was 22%. These are the Gallup poll data, and the bright blue line on the bottom represents people who have a non-theistic worldview of human origins. They think humans evolved. If you add the 33% of people who think humans evolved but God guided the process though, which is the orange line in the middle, you get 55%. 2019 was the first year ever since Gallup started asking this question of Americans in 1982 that a slim majority of Americans included at least some flavor of evolutionary thinking when it comes to the origin of humans. But why is this figure so low when new discoveries about human origins garner wide press coverage and grace the cover of popular magazines? What are the barriers to acceptance of evolution and how can we overcome them? How can you overcome them? I'm gonna tell you today about our non-conflict approach at the Smithsonian and give you some data that suggests our approach is working pretty well. I think our approach reflects a quote by Maya Angelou. People will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Before I dig into the feelings part though, let me try to make the scientists among you more comfortable for a bit with some data. There are many factors influencing public acceptance of human evolution in the US and around the world and acceptance of evolution in general. Age, political affiliation, education level, and the one that most people think of, religiosity. So how do we bridge this divide? What approach do we use? First, let me tell you what we don't do. If you wanna do it wrong, try an approach called the information deficit model of science communication. In this case, this is the idea that if only people knew more information about human evolution, they'd understand it and accept it. So you just keep giving them more information, as if you could open their brain, pour in information, and then they would instantly accept your perspective. But humans don't work like this, and there are a lot of studies out there that confirm this. Here's the problem, though. This is what we're taught to do as scientists, so it feels comfortable to us. Just providing information might work in a classroom teaching setting or at a professional conference, but will it work with your conspiracy theorist cousin, your science skeptical neighbor, the stranger sitting next to you on the train? What do you think? Think about it. The last time you had a disagreement with someone who tried to convince you of their point of view by continuing to just throw information at you, not really listening to your point of view, not stopping to figure out the underlying reason why you were having a disagreement, how did that go? Did you feel respected, listened to? Did you change your mind? I didn't think so. Here's another thing not to do. Don't make assumptions about people who don't accept human evolution and who do. How does it feel when someone else assumes they know how you feel and why you feel that way? Not great. For example, don't assume that all people of faith are anti-evolution or that acceptance of evolution necessitates abandonment of faith. Don't assume that all evolutionary scientists are atheists or anti-religion or that evolutionary scientists are trying to disprove the existence of God. All of these assumptions are absolutely false and there are good data out there to show it. Basically, don't assume that the only way science and religion can interact is the conflict mode. I'm here to tell you that embracing evolution and having religious faith can be compatible. Okay, you're thinking, but how? So let me first start with how to even approach this topic with someone you don't know. Start with curiosity about the other person. Try to find common ground, seek connections, you have to begin wanting to have a respectful, open, honest conversation, to be welcoming to people who have a different way of seeing the world than you do, and to create a safe environment for asking questions. Now I'll give some examples of how we put this approach into practice at the Smithsonian and beyond. I facilitate public programs right in the Hall of Human Origins, a permanent exhibit all about human evolution at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. One program is The Scientist is In. Rather than presenting complex data up on a stage, this program features experts standing at a mobile cart with objects, just talking with museum visitors, like in this photo. I do a little science communication training with them in advance. Introduce yourself with your name, make a human connection, 
Encourage visitors to ask questions, follow their lead, validate their enthusiasm, their confusion, and their concerns. Crouch down to get on the same level as kids. Encourage them when they're thinking like scientists. Is the goal of this program to impart information? Sure. But is the more important goal of this program to have visitors walk away with a positive feeling about their interaction with a scientist? Yes. I'll tell you a story about my own experience with this program. I was the expert as in, in an exhibit about women in science. I had cool fossils on my cart, but I also had photos of myself and my son in the field in Kenya from when he was six years old, so I could talk about the struggles of being a scientist mom. A visitor approached me, a mom and two daughters. She saw what I had on the cart, realized what my research was about, and asked me, so you believe in this evolution stuff? Immediately, the goal for my interaction changed. Sure, I wanted to make sure her daughters got a chance to touch a million-year-old fossil, but more importantly, I wanted to make sure the other mom and I found some point of connection, that she left feeling like I honored her questions, respected her perspective, and understood her discomfort, that she had a positive interaction with a scientist witnessed by her daughters. Maybe this moment would even open the door for them to see themselves as scientists. Does this approach work? It does. In an evaluation of our scientists is in programs, 94% of visitors displayed nonverbal signs of engagement, nodding, laughing, pointing, and focused listening. 67% demonstrated curiosity by asking at least one question. 47% verbally expressed awe and wonder. Importantly, visitors who talked to a scientist were significantly more likely to rate their general science interest high, say they enjoy studying science and would like to be a scientist than visitors who didn't. But we don't stop at the walls of our museum exhibit. We take this approach on the road. This is a view of a part of our traveling exhibit called Exploring Human Origins, What Does It Mean to Be Human? In partnership with the American Library Association and with support from various funders, our traveling exhibit visited 19 public libraries across the US between April 2015 and April 2017. But it was not just the exhibit that traveled. Four of us from the Smithsonian, who I affectionately call the away team, traveled as well to engage with people in these communities. We put on four programs at each of those libraries, and I want to tell you about two of them. One was Exploring the Meanings of Human Evolution, a Community Conversation. This program aimed to explicitly address the variety of religious and cultural perspectives that intersect with scientific findings on human evolution, and to create room for discussions through civil and open dialogue that invited people attending to voice their personal insights. We also explored the idea that scientific and religious perspectives on human evolution need not inherently conflict. This photo shows one of those discussions in action. Another program was a private invite only special event for religious leaders and prominent members of faith communities on the topic of human evolution. Yes, we did. Following a tour of the exhibit led by curator Dr. Rick Potts, we engaged participants in a discussion regarding questions the exhibit might raise for their communities. Here's a photo of one of those tours. The post-tour discussions were illuminating. We asked questions, we listened to answers. Sometimes we found bridges and sometimes we agreed to disagree. But we always had thoughtful, respectful conversations. I can tell you a story about an interaction I had in one of our library visits too. I had just finished giving an exhibit tour to a group of librarians when a young man, high school age, quietly approached me. He had come into the library to do his homework, but I could see he noticed the tour and he was listening. He said, can I ask you some questions? Of course, I answered. He proceeded to ask me some questions that I recognized as ones commonly outlined from anti-evolution points of view, but I could also see he was genuinely struggling with them. I honored his questions and I answered them as best I could. At the end of our conversation, he looked me in the eyes and said, thanks, I've never had a place to ask these questions until now. We worked with an external company to do a detailed audience study of reactions to our traveling exhibit. You can look at this cute photo of a creative art-oriented program for kids put on by one of the libraries while I tell you a little bit about the evaluation data. Of the over 200,000 visitor and program participants, 35% held beliefs that rejected or were skeptical about human evolution. Yet of this skeptical subsample, what proportion do you think said they enjoyed the exhibitor program? 73%. How about agreed that scientific research on human evolution can enrich our understanding of what it means to be human? 59%. How about agreed that my faith or worldview can coexist with the idea that humans evolved over time? 58%. 
And how about agree that the exhibit or program presented human evolution in a way respectful of my beliefs? 53%. Remember, this is the approximately one third of visitors who held an anti-evolution worldview. But my favorite number, how many thought the exhibit or program was trying to change my mind about something I do not believe? Only 10%. Here's what's probably my favorite comment card left by an exhibit visitor. It says, best exhibit ever. The skulls are great. I love the timelines and the skulls. I don't know what to say, but I love them. Same. I want to end with this, a sign that was up right outside the library in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, when our traveling exhibit was there. Ephrata was the community that received the most challenge about the exhibit. The countryside surrounding Ephrata is home to a large number of Amish and Old Order Mennonite families who are a very traditional people living in rural areas that reject modern technology. They don't use electricity or running water. They only have horse-drawn buggies for transportation. These groups are Christian but broke away from mainstream Christianity in the 16th century in Europe because they believed it was too worldly and corrupt. There were death threats to the effort of librarian and letters of boycott, and they quietly had police presence at the library for all of our programs. But they did not have a single protest in the library, and they also had the largest number of people ever visit their library in a single month, about 30,000. Pretty impressive for a city with a population of less than 14,000 in the 2020 census. A few days after the exhibit closed there, the library hosted a farm to table community meal where people of all backgrounds could break bread together. Last I heard, they plan to make it an annual event. If people in Ephrata can talk about what it means to be human with respect, compassion, and humility, so can you. Whether you live in Johannesburg or Beijing, New York or Mumbai, Istanbul, Jakarta, Tokyo or Cairo, Brisbane, London, Sao Paulo or San Francisco, we all care about our deep, common human origins. That means something to all of us. Let's talk about it.